I'm Father Jeffrey Mickler of the Society of St. Paul, and I'd like to share with you a little bit of information on how Bible scholars do their work and how the translators provide for us an understanding and meaning of the sacred scriptures. Most of us cannot read ancient Hebrew or Greek. But all of us could benefit from the translations that are so well provided for us. But just how does a translator go about his task? It starts with a translation from what? From the manuscripts. We have no original manuscript of any writing of the New Testament or the Hebrew scriptures. Not one. We have ancient manuscripts dating back to the first century, at least fragments of them. But most of the ancient manuscripts are from a slightly later date. And not all of them are complete. We have fragments here, fragments there. So first of all, scholars try to find the most ancient manuscripts to work with and compare the various manuscripts that are available. And then, and only then, do they begin their arduous task of translation. Once they have a manuscript to work with, they look at the text. And the first question they have is, what does it actually say? And this is complicated by the fact that the words were generally written all in capital letters with no punctuation, no spaces in between. And so they can look at the same group of letters, break them up in different ways, and have absolutely different meanings to what was written there. For example, in English. The same group of letters can be read as God is nowhere or, broken up in a different fashion, God is now here. Two different ways of looking at the same group of letters. The next problem the translator has is to put the letters in their context their historical context. When were the manuscripts written? What was the problems of the time? What was the culture like? Because simply translating the words is not enough. You have to see the words in the context of the situation in which they were written to make it clear to the person in the contemporary situation. So the task is quite difficult indeed. And sometimes they'll come across words where they're not quite certain what they meant in any context. And the scholars will pull their great knowledge together and come up with a possible or a most probable explanation of what any given word might mean. And once they have an understanding of what this passage means, then they have to determine in what form to put it in in English. So you can see the work of translation is never ending and there'll never be a perfect translation. And then on the other end is the English language itself. It is always changing and developing. When you studied some of the ancient English writers, remember how difficult it would be. Many high school students find Shakespeare impenetrable because of the nature of the language itself and how the words were used. When skilled actors bring them to life, then it's easy to follow the stories and to become involved with the plots. If we go beyond Shakespearean language, we can see the further back we go, the more difficult it is for us who speak English today to understand how English was spoken and written centuries ago. So when we have contemporary English in very rapid change, the translators 
have to be aware of that. So the English words they choose have to be current so that it will be understandable to the reader. So they have to be aware of the ancient language and contemporary language and how it's always changing and always developing. Now the translators also have this great difficulty that the ancient manuscripts were handed down from one generation to the next by copyists. And these copyists were marvelous individuals, very dedicated. They loved what they did. And they did it with a great sense of reverence because they knew they were spreading the word of God and handing the word of God on from one generation to the next. Ancient rabbis preserving the Hebrew scripts and ancient monks copying over and over the scriptures word for word. But sometimes they would make a mistake and realize it. Leave a word out, leave a sentence out. So rather than rewrite the whole page, they would write the word in the margin. And the next scribe would say, oh, this is meant to be placed inside the sentence here. Here's where it logically goes. So the next one would write the manuscript with the word in the proper place. But the problem is complicated by the fact that sometimes an ancient scribe would write his own commentary in the margin or his own reflection, what we would call his own footnote. And the next scribe that comes along would see that and say, is this a part of the scriptures? Or is this another scribe's personal reflection and interpretation? So as the scribes would pass on the manuscripts from one generation to the next, the question became how many footnotes wormed their way into the text? And this is where the quest for ancient manuscripts is so important. If they find in a more ancient manuscript that a word or phrase was not in a later, the scriptures as it appeared in a later manuscript, then they could be pretty certain that it was a scribal insertion into the sacred word. So the scholar's work is never done. It's very arduous and very demanding. So we have these ancient manuscripts containing the truths of God that we can apply to our own lives. When properly translated, they are a great help. But we see the need, therefore, because of all these complex issues, for footnotes in our modern translations and accurate introductions to each of the books to help guide us. Now, some people become so attached to one translation or another that they refused to even consider the value of other translations. On my desk, I have a dozen different translations. And when one stumps me or I don't quite understand what was written in one Bible, I pick up another translation and compare the translator's approaches to the same passages and get more insight into what the inspired writer was actually trying to tell me. And I also know that the next generation of scholars will have more data, more information than our current generation, and they will make adjustments to the translations that I am studying currently and love so deeply. So we have to remember that it's the living word of God is believed in the whole community that contains what the word of God in Jesus Christ was meant to convey to us. And it's this living word that we carry in our hearts, that the church carries in its great teaching and living tradition that helps us grow with the scriptures and helps the scriptures keep us on the right path in life. I hope that you'll be scholarly in your own approach, 
to the sacred word, that you'll take it to heart yourselves, and that you'll love the written word and live it well.